Okay, so uh, Kira is our first uh, speaker this morning. She is a developer at Culture Amp, an all-in-one people feedback and analytics platform. She works with a varied stack including React and Rails on solutions to help customers share and act upon company employee engagement data. Kira is an advocate for using functional programming techniques to improve the JavaScript coding and refactoring experience. When she's not writing code, she can be found under a large cat. Thank you, Kira. And I'm connected. This should be showing. It should be. Yeah, right. We've had some troubles with this as well. Do you have a USB C? Uh, that's just. Plain USB, I think. Uh, oh, sorry, plain. Yeah, this we works. Tested we tested this. Okay, I'll give it another shot. Did we use an adapter? An HDMI adapter? No, I don't think so. Yeah, that's Hey, excellent. Hi. As Fraser said, my name's Kira. I'm a developer at Culture Amp. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about Reason React. One of the things I love about programming and being in tech is that I get to be new at something at all the time. So what I don't know about you is what you're new at. I deeply suspect you're not new at functional programming, um, but you may be new to React. And you may have a team that works React with React that does not use functional programming. So today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about React, a little bit about ReasonML, and bring those two concepts together to talk to you about what Reason React is. So for those of you who have never worked with React, React is a JavaScript library that's used to create uh, user interfaces. It's pretty popular. It gets about 1.7 million downloads a week. And last year in the State of JS survey, it was the dominant player. So out of um, libraries that had been used, it was the one that rated the most highly. And it also rated most highly amongst the things that people would choose to use again. Now, the way that you use React is that you encapsulate pieces of code into components. And then you can assemble those pieces of code into a user interface. You can also reuse those pieces of code across your application. In React, you have stateless components and you have stateful components. So a stateless component is a piece of JavaScript that receives some data and just displays it. It's purely presentational. With a stateful component, it knows a bit more about itself. It might know whether a modal is open or it might manage its own data. But within these components, we're just rendering HTML. And this, when this came out, this was horrifying to a lot of people. It's HTML rendered in JavaScript. But when when you refer to these within your components, um, you use like a J, uh, an XML-like syntax, and that syntax is called JSX. So here we've got that header and that button, and we're just referring to that. But if React is so popular, and why would we ever need to move beyond it? And the answer is because the underlying language of React is JavaScript. JavaScript the language of the web. 
written in 10 days in the 1980s. JavaScript is a very powerful language and JavaScript, I know some people will disagree with that, but you do need to be a bit of an expert in order to wield it without having unexpected outcomes. And that has led to people trying to avoid JavaScript through a bunch of different ways. They've even defined something that's known as the JavaScript problem. This is from the Haskell website. And I just want to be clear, the JavaScript community, which I'm a part of, is very well aware that its language can be problematic and it can yield some unexpected outcomes. And they're working really, really hard to try and address these issues. For example, in item one here, we've got a lack of a module system. That has been addressed in ExmaScript 2015, also known as ES6. Also, item number three here, the verbose function syntax. That's been addressed in ExmaScript 2015. We've got, um, we've got arrow functions, it's a, it's a lot more concise. But we still have weak typing. We still have some strange coercion behavior. We still have this, this scoping that's kind of a bit weird. And unfortunately, we still need JavaScript. It's the language of the web. And a few other communities have had a bit of a crack at utilising their own preferred languages or associated script versions or compilers to try and come up with a better solution. And if you are using one of these languages, I am not here to say that Reason is a better option than anything you might be using for your use case. But if your team is using mainstream JavaScript and you would like them to move to a more functional programming paradigm, you might have more luck convincing them with Reason than with another option, particularly if you work with React. So if the underlying language for React is JavaScript, the underlying language for Reason React is Reason, and you get to sidestep the JavaScript problem. Reason React is essentially a simpler and safer way to build React components, but just in Reason. So what is Reason? Reason is an umbrella project, but it is an alternative syntax for OCaml and its associated toolchain that surrounds it. It's built by the developers at Facebook um, who were already using OCaml in libraries such as Flow. Reason has the same semantics as OCaml, but just with a friendlier syntax. So what is OCaml? Are there any OCaml developers here? Hey, <laughs> my friend, your time has come. So OCaml is an object-oriented imperative functional programming language, which means it's quite pragmatic. You can do a bunch of stuff with it. You can't do everything with it, um, ad hoc polymorphism, etc. but you can do a bunch of stuff with it. It was functional and then around 1996, the objective typing system came into being, and it, but it only got renamed OCaml in about 2011. So here we have some JavaScript syntax, some reason syntax, and some OCaml syntax side by side. And when Reason came out in May 2016, the creator was um, pinged on Hacker News and said, why did you create a JavaScript clone? And he said, I didn't actually set out to create a JavaScript clone. What I set out to do was take out the 15 or so things in OCaml that was really annoying to established OCaml developers. But when you do that, it just looks a little bit like JavaScript. Of course, since that time, they've actually made They've been very intentional about trying to bridge the gap between um, OCaml and JavaScript. But in the initial stages, that wasn't the case. So for me, the syntax falls into three kinds of buckets. There's the bucket that you write it like JavaScript with reason. And when you look at it in the compiler, you look at the compiled output, it looks like JavaScript. Then there's the, you write it like JavaScript. But when you look at the compiled output, it doesn't look like JavaScript. And then the, whoa, it, this is nothing like JavaScript area. Most of the things I'm finding is falling into the first two categories. So here we have the string um, syntax, and that pretty much falls into the first category. There are some minor differences with string concatenation, as you can see in the final row, but mostly it looks like JavaScript, compiles like JavaScript. The true and false and the and or greater than, less than, equal um, operators, that's writes like JavaScript, but under the hood it's a little bit different. So here we have two functions, one in Reason, one in JavaScript, and the syntax for those functions are exactly the same. So it's a function greater than that takes two numbers and returns true if the first number is greater than the second number. But when you look at the buckle script output, what 
Douglas, what um, is happening is they're actually using the OCaml standard library. So we're using the OCaml standard library's greater than function. Similarly, if you create in JavaScript, you decide, you assign a variable, it's let x equals 5, you can take that variable and increment it by 1 and that's fine. But here's some reason out, output from the reason console. You, if you try and do the same thing, it will throw an error. Instead, you have to redeclare that let binding. And this is not reassigning that variable, it's basically shadowing the original let binding and so the original one still exists and that is in scope until it's redeclared. Now this is the kind of syntax that falls into this is not at all like JavaScript. And if you do want to use the same variable and use, and use mutability, you have to be very explicit about it in reason. You can't just, you can't do mutability without, uh, without being intentional. So we've got the JavaScript version of x equals x plus one, in reason, you have to define a reference and x is a reference with a value of five. So on the second line in the reason column, we can see x plus one, but you have to dereference it with the caret first to get the value, increment it by one, and then store it back in the same reference. So this is not JavaScript land anymore. This is functional programming land and it's something, but it, the differences are small enough that it's easier to get on board. So I found it helpful to understand how Reason fits in and how the rest of the tool chain fits in by looking at this blog post by Andrew Heron. And so what happens, if you think of the OCaml uh, compiler as a modular system, it has an input phase, a checking phase, and an output phase. So you use the OCaml syntax, you read it in and check it against the OCaml semantics, and then you can compile it out into bytecode or native code. If you want to then have a web application, you can recompile that. You can send the compiled output to JS of OCaml. It's a dependency, but it will recompile your JavaScript for you. Then in 2016, Bloomberg came out with BuckleScript. And so instead of this two-phase compilation process that was a little bit slower, they dug into the compiler and replaced the output phase. So now they're delivering you highly performant, highly readable JavaScript code. This is an example of some reason. And on line one, where we're creating a function, it's add five, it takes a number, and it returns a number plus five. Then we're using the value of that function out on line three. And then we're redeclaring the same uh, function, add five, except this time it takes two numbers on line five, and then returns the two numbers plus five. And this is what the buckle script output would look like. So you can see on line five, it's it's completely got, the first thing you see is just console log A. It's completely gotten rid of the original declaration. So it's part of the dead code elimination that BuckleScript does and instead we just have what we're actually using and then the redeclaration of the function. And where reason fits into this is that reason um, swaps the input phase. So now you're writing input that looks like JavaScript and it's being checked against the OCaml semantics and then you've got output that looks like JavaScript. Of course, you can use the OCaml compiler to do bytecode and native codes uh, still, and some people are using uh, Reason React Native and creating mobile applications this way. Which brings us to here. Why would I say that you might have an easier time convincing your team to adopt Reason than another compiled to, pro uh, to JavaScript functional programming language? When I showed Reason to my team, we had looked at functional programming languages before, but we were faster and more productive in React. But they got very excited about this. And in fact, it ended up being me, because this was in July last year, being me being the one saying, it's not ready yet, it's really early, it's bleeding edge. But we did end up adopting it and we really enjoyed it. And across the web in those early stages, I was seeing other React developers also come to the same conclusion. By actively creating something that maps to the mental model that React and JavaScript developers are working with, the Reason core team has made huge strides in reducing the barrier to entry for functional programming for your standard JavaScript developer. And it's not surprising that we felt that way because there's a bunch of research out there that says it's way easier to assimilate new concepts if you can unite them with concepts that you already know. 
So I've talked a little bit about the syntax, but there's also the workflow and the React mental model that I found really helped me get on board. So this is what my workflow looks like as a JavaScript developer. I use npm and yarn to install my, no my node modules. I use eslint. I use prettier for code formatting. I use flow as a type checking um, system, but it's kind of a bit the same as JavaScript. You need to know flow. You need to have a level of expertise in it in order to wield it correctly because it's quite easy to lie to. And then if you don't have proper uh, editor integration, etc., you might not realize that you're not actually checking anything properly. And I use immutable JS for data, um, immutable data structures. And this is what my reason workflow looks like. Again, I'm using NPM and Yarn. I don't need flow because I've got static typing. I don't need prettier because I've got reformat. And reformat was the ancestor to prettier. It was the inspiration for it. It existed before that. I use Reason Router, which came out in uh, January, which is great. Uh, before that, I used BuckleScript Director. So it's all pretty much the same thing, except for one key difference. Almost everything I use in React to augment and make my React development uh, process better is a dependency, whereas all those same things that I'm using in Reason has been brought down to the language level or into the tool chain. Now, I really enjoy coding React. I ship features, I'm creative, I'm productive, I generally have a really fun time. But upgrading dependencies and refactoring legacy code around those dependencies is error prone and fraught and I don't really enjoy that process. So part of the reason that I am so enthusiastic about this, this syntax is that I think this is going to make everyone who ships products lives better. It's also pretty easy to get on board with. Um, you install a global uh, BuckleScript platform which allows you to uh, access the BuckleScript compiler and then you can piggyback off the usual React ecosystem. So you can use Create React App still and just pass it the tag of Reason Script. So then you get Webpack set up and hot module reloading, etc. But if you don't want all of that and you just want a really simple application, you do have just the BuckleScript init version available to you too. I would suggest installing uh, the Reason CLI tools, however, because this is me trying to get up to speed with the type system. Essentially, when you learn a new language, you expect some friction. And for me, the fact that the only friction I had was in the type system was fantastic. It just gave me something to concentrate on. So, really, 10 minutes to go? I've, got, I've been speaking only for 15. Yeah, we can go a bit okay. Great. Um, so this is what the editor integration looks like. It's, uh, it's VS Code and the editor integration really helped me with getting up to speed um, on the typing system. It basically educated me as I went. So the other key similarity I'd like to talk to about is the React mental model. So when I see a design with my designer and I know that I need to build that, I pretty much know exactly what I need to do with React. And the fact that I can just use the Reason, the React component lifecycle in Reason has been super helpful. You don't lose anything. You can tell you de your React developers, yes, you can do this still, but you don't lose anything, you just gain type safety. The only thing that you did lose one thing, you, lose, you lost component wheel mount. In my entire React career, I have used that once, um, so I haven't missed it yet in Reason React. The concept of props is now the concept of labelled arguments, but it's a one-to-one -one mapping, use, use the same concept. So here is an um, example uh, component. We're passing it in the data some prop, uh, hello to some prop, and then within the example component, we're accessing that data using this.props.sumprop. prop. Then in the make function, in a reason component, we pass the data in the same way, but we're just using the little tilde symbol is the symbol for a labelled argument and we just use it, reference it in, within the component that same way. You have optional lab labelled arguments the same way that you have optional props. You have default label arguments the same way that you have default props. And in React, as we saw, you have stateless and stateful components. And in Reason React, you also have stateless and stateful components. But they changed it in the second half of last year 
to the reducer component when they change the API. And in a reducer component, you define a state type. Here it's just very simple, it's counter int. And then you define your actions. And the actions are just the ways that your stateful component is going to try and modify itself, either increment the counter, open a modal, that kind of thing. So in the make function, and every reason react module is essentially a React module that just defines a make function. You set your initial state, so we, this is the state that we want to have rendered in the component, and then you define a reducer function that takes action and state. You can then use pattern matching on the actions that you've defined. So if you pass in, for example, the action of click into the switch statement, it will then send and initiate the action, the um, update associated with the click function. If you want to do side effects, you can do side effects, but you just have to be very intentional about it and explicit about it and use the function reason react update with side effects. It's a little bit verbose, but it gets the message across. So in this case, you would increment the count, and then after that, you would use self.send to initiate a new action. So it's the time in the talk where I'm going to talk a little bit about an application. This is my application. It's amazing. You click a button, it fetches some data, it recrawls the audience, and then it shows a loading spinner. Yep, it's excellent. Let's move on. So I want to look at three real world things that React developer might do and how you would then do that in a Reason React application. First of all, if you are starting with Reason React and you have a product that is using React, it's most likely that you are going to be incorporating it into an existing React application than starting from Greenfield if you're using this in production. So being able to uh, switch between your components is going to be really important as far as uh, encouraging people to get on board with this. So in order to use a React component, you essentially define, you, you take your React component, which is a button, and it has two props, handle button click and label, and then you define a wrapper function. So here on line one, we have the buckle script module. This is the foreign function interface for reason. And I find it, I really like the fact that I could just drop into buckle script in the middle of a file for JavaScript interop. And on line one, the first thing we do is we define the buckle script module and refer to the React component, which is button. We then define its external name. So its external name is how we're going to refer to this module within our reason code. And I've chosen the name button RE, but you could choose anything, it's, it's just arbitrary. Then I define its class, reason react, react class. And then I give it the name default. Now, this is not arbitrary. This is based on the fact that in the component, it's export default class from that module. Then on line three, we pass in a couple of labeled arguments, handle button, click and label. And on line four, this is where it all happens. We use the reason react wrap JS for reason function. And that has two labelled arguments. It has a React class, which we pass the external, but, uh, external module that we've defined. And then we pass it a record, which is how the props are defined. And a record, it looks like a JavaScript object, but it's not a JavaScript object. And this is what the buckle script output looks like for that. As you can see, we've got the import statement happening up on line four. And down on line eight, we're passing the wrap.js for reason function, the button.default. And if you want to incorporate reason components into React components, you go through a very similar process, just defining a, compo a component and a make function, etc. Another thing you often want to do with a uh, application is fetch data from APIs. So for this, we will need a couple of dependencies. We'll need BuckleScript JSON and BuckleScript fetch. And we'll define a record type to represent the magic eight ball JSON response. And it's got a question, an answer, and a response type. This is the JSON format that we're expecting back. And so the information that we're interested in is nested as a JSON object under the magic field. So here on line 18, we're using BuckleScript fetch to fetch some data from the URL. We're then piping that into a JavaScript promise. So all of these tools that people are used to using, if they're a React developer, you still have promises. 
Um, async await is still yet to come though. Um, then once that promise is resolved, you pass the JSON to the function pass response JSON that's defined on line 14. That function is responsible for extracting the data from the field magic and sending it to the function decode response JSON. So here we have let decode response JSON and on line 8 we're using the JSON.decode module and it, it's JSON.decode.curly brackets and what that means is that essentially within the scope of that expression we're opening up the JSON.decode module and we can just use all of the fields within that. We don't have to be verbose about it, we don't have to write JSON.decode.field or JSON.decode.string to access those functions. When you are fetching data from an API, there will be times when you have data and times when you don't have data. And in JavaScript, you might need to use a null check or an undefined check, but you don't have to do that um, in reason. It's, it's a lot nicer. You use pattern matching. First, you create an option type and you wrap your data that you're expecting in that option type. And an option type has two variants. It has some and it has none. So it either has, yes, I have some data or no, I have no data. And then you can choose what you return based on which option it matches, which variant it matches to. So if I do have some data, please send me an answer component with data passed into it. And if I don't have any data, please render a loading image. So to close, I'd like to outline what Reason React might mean to the React community and what it means to me on a personal level. For a start, on a macro level, this is what the creators of React believe is the future of React. React was initially, uh, the prototype for React was initially done in um, SML. So it was React SML, but they shelved that because they felt that the community wasn't ready for an SML language, but it was still developed in a way that it could bind to React later. Um, you could still use a functional programming language to bind it later. So this has been quite intentional. I once said on the Discord channel that, oh, they're playing a really long game. And they're like, you have no idea. The creative React Jordan Walk says, in short, it is the best way to take React to the next level. And having coded in React and Reason React, I absolutely believe that 100%. But on a personal level, and yes, we've all seen this meme, it's a teensy bit tired, but it does demonstrate something for me. I started off with JavaScript and HTML. Actually, I started off in the back end, but that's another story. And then I started creating React or using React and I really enjoyed it. I'm now writing Reason React and I'm feeling like I'm using all of my React knowledge. I haven't had to start all over again, but I'm, I'm able to chunk and learn these new things as I go. And then maybe one day I'll be doing all functional programming. I'm doing the Data61 Haskell course next week, so. I'm looking forward to my brain oozing out of my ears. Um, but the funny thing is, is that actually I'm kind of already in the last box because I'm writing OCaml. I mean, it's all OCaml. It just doesn't feel like OCaml. It feels like I'm in this middle spot. And if you can get other people to step one step closer and go into that middle spot, then more people will be writing in a safe way and more people will be learning the benefits of these things that you already value. So it doesn't necessarily feel like functioning, pro functional programming, it just feels like writing a new flavour of React. If you've had any interest in anything I've had to say, I would highly encourage you to join the Discord community. They have been so kind and they really help. Any, anybody who um, asks a new question, they really take the time to go through. And there's uh, people, new people joining every day, so everyone's asking those same questions and you can search through it. Sometimes you never have to ask, because. There's not much on Stack Overflow, but there's heaps in there. And also, here's a bunch of great resources. Um, if you're interested, I'll try and post these slides somewhere later and tweet them uh, with the hashtag in case you're interested. But feel free to come and have a chat to me afterwards. Thank you.
Oh, that's a good one. But oh, sorry. How do you? Uh, you did say that, didn't you? Um, how do I find using uh, Reason React with CS CSS people who are doing styling? Um, that was essentially it. In my workplace, I don't really need to because I'm the I'm the the front end person who also does the CSS. But I can imagine. Uh, I know that our people who were working with Elm had a little bit of difficulty in the, that they didn't know how to get in and, and change the code, whereas the way I write CSS in my React is exactly the same as I write my CSS in Reason React. I'm using CSS modules and it's fine. So they'll just go into the CSS file. I'm using the same class names uh, paradigm. So if it wasn't me, um, I don't think they would have a problem because I'm using the same approach. Cool. Thank you.